Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India It is my great pleasure to introduce distinguished scientist Professor Joshua Labar. Today and next few lectures will be delivered by Professor Joshua Labar. He is the executive director of Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University and the director of Virginia G. Piper Biodesign Center for Personalized Diagnostics. Dr. Labert has been one of the foremost investigators in the rapidly evolving field of personalized diagnostics. Dr. Josh Labert has been instrumental in development of cell-free expression based protein microarray platforms. One of the main contribution of his group has been development of nucleic acid programmable protein arrays or NAPA technology. Dr. Labert is particularly interested in advancing biomarker discovery based programs in particular to find out biomarkers for early detection of cancers and autoimmune disorders using protein microarrays. He has built a fully sequenced verified clone sets for model organisms and pathogen genes which is one of the huge contribution for the whole society and very important reagent resource for the researchers who want to perform high throughput biology. Dr. Labert is the principal investigator on a 36 million dollar contract to develop a blood based diagnostics that predicts absorbed radiation dose received after a radiation event 1 to 7 days after exposure which is sponsored by Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. He is also the past president of US HUPO and one of the conveners of last year conducted Human Proteome Organization World Congress in Orlando. Dr. Labert is going to talk about biomarker discovery based program, various considerations for statistical tools which are required for biomarker evaluations and validation and how to make NAPA arrays using very simple lab based resources. Then perform autoantibody based screening for different cancers especially breast cancer and how to also utilize the protein microarray based platforms for functional studies especially the PTM based analysis. In today's lecture Professor Josh Lebert will talk to you about the basics of proteomics, its significance for high throughput gene cloning experiments and what are the steps required for gene cloning and generating clones which could be used for high throughput experiments even later on. So, the kind of resources and reagents which you can generate using the novel cloning technologies then later on you can simply transfer the genes of interest into any vectors for your given experiment. I am sure Dr. Labert will introduce you not only the concepts of proteomics, but also the details about how to generate these high quality reagents which could be useful for your research. So, let us welcome Dr. Josh Labert for his lecture. All right, I think we're ready to get started, yeah? All right, so um, I'm going to start a little bit at the beginning. We have, we have several lectures here to cover on terms of the NAPA technology. And so I thought it would be useful to sort of begin where we began. So this is where um, biology was 10, 15 years ago. Um, what I mean by that is that we were studying proteins a few at a time you know maybe three or four or five proteins at a time 
and that's you know that's how much information we were getting. But what we were really trying to understand was the entire proteome. And we would take these proteins and we would do a certain set of assays on them. Maybe we would do look at drug selectivity, we might look at what the substrates were, we might do a variety of biochemical assays or we might do uh, sort of uh, uh, cell based assays on those proteins. We would test them for a variety of features and each one would get a different color sort of attached to it. Um, but what we really wanted, if you look at only a few things at a time, you can't really get a full picture of what's there, right? If you look at this, you know, you, you don't know what that color means. If you look at that, you don't get, know what that color means. What you really want to do is everything. Because when you do everything, then you get to see the whole picture. You really understand what it is you're trying to look at and what it means. And that's really where proteomics comes in. Proteomics is the idea of not studying one or a few proteins at a time but studying all of them, trying to get a comprehensive study of everything. So, there are two general approaches to proteomics. One approach here is looking at the abundance of specific proteins. How much protein is present? And what you typically do with the abundance approach is you compare uh, the proteins in the disease to the proteins in the normal, in the normal tissue. And you ask, are there proteins that are changed in the context of disease relative to normal? And then the hope would be that if you do this over and over again, you'll identify which proteins are altered in disease, and that will provide useful information about what's causing, what's causing the illness. The, typically, this approach requires mass spectrometry or some type of technology that can measure the levels of proteins in a sample. The other approach and the one that I'll talk about today is what I call a function based approach. And the goal here is to look at the individual proteins and ask what do they do? What's their role? How do they behave? Who do they interact with? You know, are they altered in disease? And obviously these two approaches are complementary, right? They support each other. So, so what are the ways that we can look at the function of proteins, right? So here are a few of them. You can look at where proteins localize in cells or in the body and that may tell you something about the role of that protein. You can look at how that protein is modified. Is it phosphorylated? Is it acetylated? Is it, you know, is it ubiquitolated? Modifications of proteins tell you something about what they do. You can look at the structure of the protein. So what is its three dimensional folding? How does it, how does, what shape does it take? That will give you a clue about what its role is. And you can look at which other proteins that protein interacts with, right? This, this uh, topic that we're here today to talk about is interactomics. So who, does, who, does, who do proteins interact with? Who do they come in contact with? That tells you something about what they do. So how do you do, the, how do, you do those various studies? Well, if you want to look at the location of a protein, you might tag that protein with a fluorescent marker like the GFP, put it in cells and ask, where does it localize? If you want to look at its modification, you might uh, purify the protein using an epitope tag and look at it under mass spectrometry and ask what modifications can I observe on that tagged protein. If you want to look at the structure, you might purify the protein and then after you purify the protein, you would crystallize it and you would do three dimensional structures using x-ray crystallography. And if you wanted to look at the interactors of that protein, at least using traditional methods, you might tag that protein and then do like a yeast 2 hybrid assay or some kind of pull down assay to look at what proteins are attached to the protein that you're looking at, right? And then the, the goal of course is to do this in high throughput. What you want to do is look at these studies th a thousand proteins at a time. All right, so we looked at this kind of method when we began our work a number of years ago and what, one of the first things we observed was that there are some things that all of these methods have in common. First of all, you have to be able to make proteins. You have to be able to express them in some circumstance. Sometimes it's in cells, sometimes it's in, cell, in, in a cell free extract, sometimes you're making it uh, 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 in vivo in the normal cir circumstance, in other cases you're using a heterologous system. All right, the other thing that they all had is that to do things in high throughput, to study proteins in high throughput, you most often need to put a tag on the protein. Do you all know what I mean by a tag? 
an epitope tag, a chimeric tag. If you try to purify all proteins by their very biochemical nature, it's very cumbersome and you can't do that times thousands. And the goal here is to be able to study proteins hundreds of them at a time or thousands of them at a time. And so the easiest way to do that is to put a GFP tag on them, a GST tag on them, a HIST tag on them, some kind of tag that will allow you to have a biochemical hook to study, the, to study all the proteins in the same way. All right, and when we began this work, this was what, what the field looked like, right? So what am I looking at? Well, we're looking at a couple of graduate students who are exhausted. So, now why are they exhausted? Well, they've been looking through those haystacks for the needle they're trying to find. And it takes a long time to sift through the, the hay to find the needle. So can we, can we, can we find a better way? Is there, is there a faster technology? So when, you, you know, if you think about a simple organism like yeast, like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there's around 6,000 unique proteins in yeast. So if you were to do high throughput screening using cDNA libraries or, or phage display or something like that, you could look at around 30,000 different uh, uh, samples and you would pretty much have sampled everything. That would be, you know, a five-fold redundancy, right? You'd look at everything five times to make sure that you, with a Poisson distribution, you would get everything. Um, uh, of course, the simplest method would be to have a cloned gene for every gene in yeast and then test it once and only once and then you would do 6,000 assays and that would be very easy, right? So the same thing would be true for, for in, in the case of humans it gets more complicated. So we now know that there are roughly 20,000, give or take a few, uh, protein, unique protein species in humans. Obviously, um, once you start taking care, uh, uh, splice variants and, and post-translational modification, that number expands dramatically. But let's just say for the sake of simple simplicity, if we took each unique gene and tested it once and only once, there would be 20,000. But you can't, if you don't have cloned copies of those genes, if you have them in libraries like cDNA libraries or phage display libraries, you can't, if you want to test all proteins, in order to get past all the redundancy, you would have to do five million assays. And that's just too many. Um, ideally what you want is a cloned collection of all of the genes in the human, each one a perfect copy so that you could test every gene once and only once, and then you would be doing roughly 20,000 assays. So 20,000, 30,000 assays, that's a number that I can imagine doing in a, in a high throughput biochemical setting. In a supermarket in the United States, if, if you look at around six items a minute when you're passing them, that you could get that done in two weeks, right? They sell 30,000 tickets for um, a lottery in a single day in the, in the state of Massachusetts. So 30,000 is a number that we could imagine we could do that, right? And so that's the, that was the goal. And so our first goal in my laboratory was to build a, a repository of cloned copies of all human genes. So obviously I'm trying to get you to protein microarrays, but before we can get to protein microarrays, we have to talk about where the, the genes come from to make those arrays. How are you going to make all those proteins if you don't have the cloned copies of genes? So the first thing we wanted was to get a, a comprehensive collection. We wanted at least one copy of every gene. Now of course in the perfect world we'd have one copy of every splice form of every gene, but at the very beginning let's at least get one representative of each gene. The second thing we wanted was a flexible format. We recognized that different users might have different applications for these genes. And so some of them would need um, uh, uh, to make the proteins in cells, as we talked about earlier. Some of them would make them in vitro, some of them would make them in the natural cell setting, some of them would be in, the, in a heterologous cell setting. So you had, to, you had to have a format that was flexible. And to get to flexible, we, we focused on this technology called gateway recombination. How many of you are familiar with gateway? Not so many yet. Okay, well now imagine doing restriction digests for every gene in the human genome. It gets to be a little complicated because you'd have to look at which enzymes could this gene, could I use for this gene, and which enzyme could I use for that gene, and for really long genes, restriction enzymes are going to start cutting up the proteins into pieces, and then you're going to have to reassemble them, or you're going to have to clone them in unique ways. It, it would be very complicated. So 
a, a number of years ago, uh, folks at what, a company that was called Life Technologies developed a technology called gateway cloning. It's, it's essentially a type of recombinational cloning. So the idea is you have, you have your favorite gene here and flanking that gene are these site specific recombination sites. And we want to be able to move this, your favorite gene into some plasmid vector that allows me to make that protein. And so by using a common system with gateway, these sites are recognized by an enzyme system from phage lambda. And so you can simply mix this plasmid plus that plasmid in solute in, in the same sample and add an enzyme and these two fragments effectively swap locations. And because these are on, they have different selectable markers and this has a death cassette in this guy, the only viable product is this one. It's the only one that survives. And when that's the only one that survives, now you can essentially develop a method for doing this operation in high throughput. You can move thousands of genes all, all, all by automation. And I'll show you that in a moment. So this is the idea. You build a library of genes in this master vector here. And then the idea is to transfer that gene into any of these other vectors to do any kinds of studies to make protein in insect cells and in human cells, bacterial cells, just by putting the gene into any specific vector. And you can do this in high throughput. And my laboratory does that a lot. We, we, we move thousands of genes from one vector to another. Okay, another thing that you want if you're going to make these clones properly so that you can do high throughput protein production is you need to make them protein expression ready. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have to remove the untranslated sequences from their mRNAs. And we also have to remove the stop codon because if we want to put epitope tags, remember we said we want to be able to put tags on these proteins. If there's a stop codon present, then, then when you translate the protein, it will stop at the stop codon and it won't allow you to add the epitope tag. And so one of the things that we had to do was go through all of the genes in the human and remove the stop codons. Um, of course, it doesn't work at all if it's not cataloged and trackable. So you have to build into the whole system a database, a tracking database, and a storage system so that when you want a gene, you know where to find it. So it's, it's the molecular version of building a library, right? You, 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 you have to store the books in a place where you can find them. Same way with the genes here. Um, one of the things that we wanted in our system was that we wanted to make these clones available to everybody. So if you're going to make a, a library of all of the genes in the human or any other organism, it should be a resource that we all share. And so when we built this, we built this in such a way that we could share it with everybody. And then the, the last thing, of course, if you've done molecular biology, you know that when you make molecules, sometimes you get a mixture. And a mixture is useless if you're trying to do experiments where you know what you're testing. And so one of the things we wanted to make sure we did was that we individually isolated each unique clone so that when we sequenced it and used it, we knew exactly what we were working with. There was no doubt about what it was. Okay, and that's the last thing I mentioned to you, which is that we sequence verified everything we built. That was key because we, oftentimes what you get doesn't work. Okay, so here, here's the goal of what we were trying to build. We called it flex to begin with for full length expression ready. And it had a number of attributes to it, right? Um, it had, the goal was to get all genes in it. We wanted to make it broadly available. We wanted to, to use a flexible format. We wanted them to be protein expression ready and we wanted them to be sequence verified. And of course we wanted this to be affordable so that people could use it. And this is sort of a cartoon that we drew years and years ago about what this would look like. Sort of this idea of a lot of tubes that had barcodes on them, each one representing a unique gene and each one addressable. Well, the good news is that that, that dream is now becoming a reality. That's, this is what it looks like today. Um, what you're looking at here is a $2 million freezer. It's a very expensive freezer, but it stores tubes in this format here. Uh, this is what the tubes look like. And on the bottom of these tubes here, you have these, bar, these 2D barcodes. And those 2D barcodes are unique for each gene. So if we were to drop a rack of these tubes, not that we ever drop racks of tubes, but if we dropped a rack of tubes, we could pick them up and put them in random order into a box. And then the barcode reader would read all those barcodes and it would know exactly where every gene was. 
because the barcodes are unique for every gene, right? Um, and of course, all of this is available at this website, DNASU, and I, if I encourage you all to go to that website. Um, all you need is those five letters, and that is a list of all the genes that we have in our collection. Right now, we have over 330,000 unique plasmids in our collection. So, a very large collection of plasmids, and they're all available to all of you. They're available to everybody on, on the planet. We, we, ship them every, we ship them every day. Um, in fact, I think we have shipped uh, over 350,000 samples worldwide now. Um, now, they're not all human. Some of them are other organisms. Uh, they're not all in gateway, but these are all plasmids that we've, we've made and or other people have made and, and given to us to share with them for uses in all kinds of experiments. So, what does this allow you to do if you have all these different clones for all these protein genes? Well, imagine that you um, wanted to look at a, uh, do a study of, of a set of genes that are unique to a particular tissue. Maybe you're, you're looking at neurological systems because you're studying brain tumors or you're looking at liver cells. Because you, uh, and you want to look at genes expressed in liver, in, in specifically in hepatic cells. You can go to the library that has the set of master clones. You can take those master clones and mix them with this expression vector to make the expression clones, the ones that have the gene in the unique vector that will make proteins in the setting that you want to study. And let's say you put them into cells and do some kind of functional assay and ask where do these proteins localize or what do these proteins interact with? So, the idea is to study proteins in high throughput and the key is to have genes for those proteins in a format that allows you to move them and study them in, in that setting. So, I'll tell you a little bit about how we make these clones. Um, uh, we still do that. We're still trying to finish the human library. We've got now um, almost 15,000 unique human genes cloned. Um, that's well on the way to getting to, to a the, the unique set that we're aiming for is around 18,000, so we're very close to getting the full, the full set. Um, the process looks a little bit like this. This is a, an overview. I will admit that um, it's altered a little bit in recent years, and I'll, I'll tell you where the, those changes have been made. But ba basically, we start by identifying the genes of interest. We design PCR primers that will capture just the open reading frame for that gene. Um, we then do PCR with those primers in, in 96 well plates, so high throughput PCR to, to capture inserts that are unique to the gene. We then capture them into the vector using a recombinational cloning system, transform them into bacteria, plate them, pick them for culture and then sequence them to, to make sure that they're correct. Now, I will mention a couple of things that we do uh, nowadays a little bit differently. Um, one thing that we're doing a little bit differently is that sometimes now, Instead of managing all of these unique clones as separate clones, sometimes we will work in batches of pools of clones, do all the processing in the batch, and then individually pick them with a colony selector. So, um, we always colony select them as unique entities, but sometimes you can do some of the processing in batch mode. The other thing that we do is nowadays we can sequence them in batches as well using next gen sequencing, which wasn't available when we began this process. So, you can actually pool clones, extract their DNA, do the sequencing as a batch, and then, and then use that to interpret the sequence of the clones. Now, there's a trick, there's a problem with that, right? And the problem with that is that when, when, um, when you, when you do next gen sequencing, you can't tell which clone a particular sequence comes from, right? Next gen is just all the sequence that's in the tube. And so, you have to be clever about how you set this up. Uh, first of all, you have to make sure that when you mix clones together, that they are nothing like each other. Because if you put two clones that are similar in sequence, and you get a mutation, you won't know which clone that came from. Does that make sense? So, if you have two genes that are almost identical, and in one of those identical regions you see an alteration, you won't know which it came from. So, whenever you mix these clones, you have to do so using informatics approaches up front that make sure that they're not at all alike. The second thing that you have to do is you have to realize that when you sequence them on batch, you can tell what the, the overall sequence of the gene was, but you can't confirm that that gene is in that, in, in, in its appropriate tube, right? 
and we need to know that the correct gene is in the correct tube. So in addition to the, the, the next gen sequencing of the whole batch, we also have to do at least one sequencing read for each gene uniquely from that tube so that we can confirm that we have the right gene in the right place. Because this comes back to that library thing. In the end you're building a library where you can go and get a specific gene from a specific tube anytime you want it. So we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Here's some of the, the automation that we use. Um, this is a, 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 a robot. Um, it's, we've transformed bacteria with DNA. Remember I told you we transformed the bacteria with the DNA. Um, we picked each of these different wells and we've plated them on these specialized plates. And these are plates that we actually invented in our laboratory. You now see them widely used in the field. Uh, what they are is they're these bioassay dishes. They're shaped like this and they have columns and rows. And each of these little areas here um, is a different clone, a different gene. And you can see, I hope you can see the different bacterial colonies collecting there. And of course this is then addressable by robots that can pick individual colonies. So we used to use undergraduates to pick colonies. And um, they, they were very well meaning, but believe it or not human beings make a lot of errors when they have to spend a lot of time using toothpicks to pick colonies and put them in wells. And, and so our error rate was around 15 percent. Um, uh, since then we now have robots to do this. Robots don't take coffee breaks. Robots don't forget where they were. Um, and robots can work for many, many hours without getting tired. So you see um, here's, here's the robot and there's a little pin coming down here um, and that's going to pick the colony and hopefully I think you can see the little colonies on the auger there. So, um, so we, we do a lot of the colony picking by this method. All right, so now you get all these clones, right? You've made this library of clones and you have them all in these tubes and you've even done some DNA sequencing. How do you know that they're correct? How are you going to make sure that the gene that you have in that, in that well is correct and all the sequences are right? Or if they're not right, how can you document that they're wrong? Well, you could hire lots and lots of people to spend lots and lots of time reading the sequences and assembling the sequences for all these clones, right? Or you could get clever and you could develop a software tool to do that. And that's what we did. We developed software that actually goes through and evaluates the clone sequence, compares it to the correct sequence, and lets us know where there are differences. All right, so I will tell you a few features of validating clone sequences. First of all, much harder than actually making the clones. Making the clones is relatively straightforward. It's a lot of molecular biology steps. You can do it. It's not terrible. But actually making sure that the sequences are correct is, takes a lot of time. Um, the first thing is of course you have, to, you have to pick individual colonies. I mentioned that before. Sequencing has no value if you're sequencing a mixture of things. Because as we said earlier, if there's a mixture, you'll never know which one is correct and which one's wrong, right? Um, and so, uh, but of course when you're working with individual clones you have a lot more work to do because you have lots more of those. And then of course you need what's called a limb system. Are you guys familiar with the term limb system? LIM, Laboratory Information Management System. What that does is it's, it's, it's an automated software application that's going to manage all of the steps in your laboratory. It's going to track each gene, each clone from well to well as it moves through all the various robotic steps. Of course this, Im this implies that all of your steps are going to be done on, on 96 well dishes with barcodes on them so that you're, you're always tracking using informatics where things are located. Um, so, so this is the, the flow process that we used for sequence validating our clones. Uh, it, began, it begins by loading up the plate information. That's the information of your plate that has all the clones on it and what genes are supposed to be in there. We then read end reads. We do, do you know what an end read is? It's just the very end of the gene. And the, the nice thing about an end read is that the primer, the sequencing primer that you use can be in the plasmid vector. So it's the same primer for every gene in your collection because it doesn't begin in the gene. It begins outside the gene in the neighboring DNA sequence. And, it, and the nice thing about that is it tells you that you have the right gene. 
Um, we then uh, have to assemble all the different reads, and this is typically for, for um, sequencing where you had to do multiple reads per gene. Um, we then compare the sequences to make sure that they are correct. So we, we, um, we look for what are called discrepancies. And I'll come back to what I mean by discrepancies in a moment. Um, we then make sure that they're not just common polymorphisms and then we rank the isolates and then we have this decision tool here which basically goes and asks if you have a discrepancy, is that discrepancy likely to be a mutation and if it is a mutation, do I reject this clone or not? Because at the end we have to decide do we keep it or do we fail the clone? Um, uh, and then in addition to all of that we have to make sure that we've got the complete sequence. So w when we assemble the sequences we compare the sequence of the gene to the expected sequence and we ask do we have it all? Have we sequenced everything or do we need to go back and get more sequence? Okay, I won't go into too long. So let me tell you about the dis what, I, what, what I mean by the discrepancy finder. So what are the, what are the reasons that a clone sequence doesn't match the correct or the expected sequence? Turns out that there's more than one reason why that can happen, of course. So um, obviously one source, the one that we're most worried about is that the clone underwent mutation. That during the process of amplifying the DNA or capturing it or making the primers, mut errors were introduced. And of course if we have too many errors in a clone, it's no longer useful, right? Because now we're not looking at biology, we're looking at mutants. <coughs> But a much more common reason why the clone sequence doesn't match is sequencing error. It turns out the actual process of doing the sequencing in itself has errors. And so therefore we may get a sequence that's incorrect but it's not the clones problem, it's the sequencing problem. It turns out that sequencing errors can occur <coughs> as often as one in a hundred bases. So if it's happening one in a hundred bases and your clone is a thousand bases long, there's a good chance you're going to have errors in there. So, how do you fix that? You, you go back and you read it again. And sometimes you have to get multiple reads to make sure that uh, you have the right clone. Um, of course, another reason why your clone might not match the, the actual, the clone sequence that you have in your database is it could be a natural polymorphism, right? If we were to sequence the genes of everybody in this room, I guarantee you will find differences all over the place. And those differences don't reflect that you're mutants, it just reflects the natural variation that occurs within a population. We all have sequence variants in our, in our sequence. In fact, I just had my genome sequenced um, this fall um, as part of a project at ASU. And <coughs> sure enough, I found all kinds of sequence variation and I have no idea what it means. So this is how we track um, sequences. This is the forward read, the reverse read of a clone. Um, and this is the assembled sequence and then we can look at its alignment <coughs> and we can look at all the discrepancies that we find. If you click on the alignment button then you get something that looks like this which is showing the alignment of the sequence with the expected sequence and obviously these colors indicate where we see discrepancies. Right here for example there are some discrepancies. Now you'll notice that these discrepancies are occurring very close to the end of the gene and that, that could be a sign that there are sequencing errors because usually at the beginning and end of reads you get some, some, some mistakes that come up. Um, and, then, and then here's the, um, what we, this is, if you click on the discrepancy button, you'll get this report and it will tell you every time there's a difference between our sequence and the expected sequence, what that difference is, <coughs> what kind of difference it is and then what implication it has on the protein. In this case, there's a frame shift deletion. That means that we're, we're, we've gone out of sync from the, the triplet codons that you expect in DNA. When you go out of sync, you have the increased opportunity to run into a stop codon and cause an aberrant truncation of the protein. And that's what happened in this case, right? Obviously, mutations that cause profound changes like that are much more deleterious in our clones than, than simple substitution mutations. Um, uh, this isolate ranker is just a tool that basically um, considers two issues. First, 
<coughs> as I in indicated a moment ago, what are the consequences of the mutation? If the, if the consequences are going to profoundly affect the protein, then that would make an isolate much less likely to be interesting. And then we need to know is the quality of the sequence in the area a good quality sequence? Because if the sequence quality is bad, then I'm much less likely to believe the mutation. If the sequence quality is bad, I'm going to, there's a very good chance that the mutation is due to bad sequencing and not good, not, not the actual mutation. So in the end you'll get a, a chart that looks like this and these various color codes indicate to us which clones are better than which other ones and so we can pick the best clone for a gene. Um, and then this, this um, last tool I'll mention here is the gap mapper and I, remember I told you ideally we have sequence for the entire gene. If we don't have sequence for the entire gene we need to go back and get an additional read to fill in the gap. Otherwise we can't say with certainty that we have a good clone. And so this gap mapper takes all the different reads from a particular gene, it assembles them by overlapping them and then looks for any areas using um, uh, essentially Bayesian mathematics, it looks for areas where there are, are missing areas and then um, we trim back the ends a little bit and then suggest that we have to go back and clone that, do another sequence read for that missing area so that we can get a better clone. Um, and then this is what that, this is what it looks like in our software and so you can see um, it, it basically predicts that there's a gap here that needs to be filled in. And then you can see these other, these colors here are indicating that the quality of sequence in that area is not great. Um, this is our decision tool. Uh, this is how do we decide whether or not to keep a clone. Our goal um, is, is always to, to um, either eliminate clones or keep them obviously. And so here we set the criteria that will make a pass or a fail and we, we allow, um, this is if the sequence is good, if the sequence is not so good, <coughs> then we can also ignore if there are polymorphisms. And so as I say, as we run through our clone list at any given time, we're always trying to move clones either into the reject category or the acceptable category. All right, so that, let me stop there and see if there are any questions on, on um, the cloning process of making clones for collections. Are there any questions I can answer? Yeah. It, it, um, so the question was what's the mechanism of sequencing error? Um, uh, it, that depends a little bit on what platform that you're using to do your sequencing. Um, <coughs> uh, a lot of what we do is using traditional um, single clone sequencing, you know, um, what they call Sanger sequencing. Uh, and in that case uh, it can vary what the causes are oftentimes. Uh, the Sanger sequencing involves different colors for different bases and sometimes you get um, a region where uh, you get a little bit more red than you should and so you, you can't really tell is it an A or is it a T, I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes it's just that you don't get adequate coverage so you don't read as many times past that base. So um, there's a lot, the, 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 me the method, the, the chemistry themselves have errors. <coughs> Lately we're using Illumina which is next gen sequencing. It also has an error frequency but it, typically with Illumina sequencing you get around that by doing so many reads, you cover it 30 times that you're less likely to, to have an error. Uh, but you, you, there's, it's, the process itself is error prone. Other questions? Yeah. How do we account for the errors from the starting database? Oh, oh, you mean the database that has the gene sequences in it? No, that is a very good point. The gene sequences that are in, you know, um, uh, uh, the databases at, at NCBI in, in, U, in the U.S., um, in the Uniproge gene sequences, all that stuff, they, they have errors in them. 
and um, and that is a, and so if we disagree with that, it's not always clear that it's us that's at fault. Um, typically, in a lot of cases, in our in our circumstance, um, well, there's two. Let me say there's two ways that we've dealt with that. The first is oftentimes <coughs> we start making our genes from existing clones where we actually know their sequence. In that case, we know what we're trying to achieve and we try to match that sequence. In the, in the case you're referring to where we're trying to match a sequence in a database, we actually did develop a polymorphism tool and I, I had slides on that and I took them out because it was going to get too long. Um, but basically what the polymorphism tool does is it goes out to um, all the existing databases where there have been gene sequences uploaded for, for all of these human genes, collects the, all the sequences from those genes and lines them up and looks at the frequency at any given position and asks are there existing examples of other clones that have the sequence I have and if there are examples of that sequence then I'm more likely to accept the sequence. Um, it's not perfect but it does help. Okay. Say that again. Well, you know, once we've once we've done that sequence validation, we think most people don't have to do it again. I mean, it's certainly reasonable if you want to be extra careful if it's a very special clone for a research project of yours, but for high throughput of materials, we've done a pretty good job of sequencing these, so I don't think you have to repeat that. And I should point out that one of the qualities of the, the gateway process, which is to transfer the insert from one master clone to an expression clone, that's a conservative molecular process. So once you know that this sequence is correct, then you know that this sequence is correct. So you don't have to resequence them both. Yes, in fact, our, all of our clones, if you go to our website, the DNA's website, we list the actual sequence of that clone. So we've done the sequence and we've loaded that up on the database. I think there was one over there. Yeah. So in the, in the clone collection that we distribute, um, we, for the most part, not every case, but for the most part, we try to limit it to no more than one amino acid difference. So if there's more than two amino acids difference, then we don't load it. I will say that at the very minimum, we always load the actual sequence. So you can always look at the actual sequence and ask, is this agree enough with what I want to do to, to use it? Um, but most of the time, it's either 100% accurate or we allow one amino acid change. Okay, well if the genome hasn't been sequenced, um, it's very hard to make the clones, right? In fact, we learned that the hard way. Um, years ago, we did a clone collection for an organism called Francisella tularensis, which is causes this illness called tularemia. And um, we were working with collaborators and those collaborators were intimately involved in the genome sequence of that organism. And they said, we'll get you an early copy of the genome. So they gave us an early copy of the genome and we used that to, to design our clone collection and then we built all those clones and it was a disaster. Um, we, our success rate which is usually in the 90 plus percent range was like 50%. It was horrible. And, um, and then about a year later they came out with the official sequence of the organism and it was very different from the sequence that they gave us originally. Um, uh, there was a lot of changes in the sequence and so when we rebuilt the collection using the correct sequence, now we had like a 96 percent accuracy. So you, you really have to have a good quality genome sequence to do this kind of work. about fundamentals of proteomics. I'm sure you are mesmerized 
but all you can achieve using proteomic technologies. You are also provided a glimpse of different protein expression based clone repositories. You also studied how to do the clone production especially in high throughput manner using robotic plating and high throughput bacterial plating. Finally, you learned how to validate these clone sequences which is one of the most important step in the entire high throughput gene cloning pipeline. We will continue more discussions in the next lecture. Thank you.